who is a marine biogeochemist uh, working currently at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. And I said it's my pleasure to introduce him because we are, we are good colleagues and friends and also because well, we share many interests in, in science and, and beyond. So Joan has an interesting trajectory and because he started off as a, as a modeler in Paris at IPSL, I'm right? No, with yeah. Ocean, sorry, with Marina Levy, modeling the effect of environmental forcing on phytoplankton bloom dynamics in the Southern Ocean. And then he moved to Tasmania for a postdoc where he studied mostly the carbon export mechanisms in the Southern Ocean again, right? And in 2019, he joined the, the BSC, the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, where, in spite of being a, in, a, in a computational uh, research uh, center, he's leading a, a research project to, to do experiments to test the, the effects of um, wildfire, wildfire ash on marine biogeochemistry, and more broadly, studying the effects of, of ash deposition and wildfire-derived materials deposition on, on ocean biogeochemistry. So I leave you with, with Juan. Thanks. Thank you, Martin. Hi, thank you for coming. Um, well, I think everything was said. I'm um, John Lord from the Federal Center for the Center. The project I'm presenting today is called Pyroplankton, and it's, uh, it's funded through a Living Planet Fellowship um, from ESA, and it's actually a co fund, so ESA funds 70%, and Barcelona Supercomputing Center pays in the 30%. So, um, this image um, shows a bit why we talk about this topic. So these are um, fires southeast of Australia, and you can see um, there the are very big fires, some of them showing um, um, atmospheric um, pyrocumbulus, so a convection created by the fire itself. And, and, and the fire, because the winds there were very strong, all this smoke and ash were going into the ocean. And fires are Wildfires, basically, are um, part of land ecosystems and are actually uh, uh, one of the three mechanisms um, in, in the way that um, organic matter can be recycled in, in land ecosystems. For some reason, this is not working. Well, just before it was working. Anyway. Ah, yeah, now it's working. So this is a nice um, animation of fires around the world. So you can see that there are most fires occur in, 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 in Central Africa, and they are like um, low, low combustion fires. But then um, these trends have been changing um, in the last um, decade, and the last year, sorry. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll present this later. But anyway, the idea here is this, this um, diagram that shows these three pathways of, of recycling pathways, and wildfires is one of them on land. But it's, it's obvious that if it works on land, it probably also works for marine ecosystems. Um, the, the first works that studied, sorry, this um, was modeling works, um, most of them led by Akinori Ito, where he included in atmospheric models, and he included um, not only dust, so we know that dust brings um, nutrients into the ocean, but he also included fuel combustion and biomass burning aerosols. And the main reason why he was interested in that is because um, when we talk about aerosols, very often we talk about iron, because iron is one of the nutrients that can induce a, a, a strongest response in, 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 in one third of the ocean that is iron limited. Dust Contains, um, so there is lots of dust, particularly in the Atlantic, as you can see here in the um, um, up right um, image. But um, iron in dust is not very high. So the soluble part of the iron in dust is around 3%. And that's important because phytoplankton only cares about um, um, soluble iron. When we go to biomass burning, um, the, 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 the total mass of aerosols is not that high but the solubility is much higher, can reach 30%. That means that biomass burning, even if the quantity is very, uh, can be very small, its effects can be very strong on ocean-based chemistry, particularly in the southern um, hemisphere where we have the southern ocean that is the biggest ocean base in, um, um, that is iron limited. And they did uh, some kind of experiment, there's the one that you can see here, the bottom right, uh, with um, an ocean-based chemistry model, and, and they they found, or this result, that mostly the impact would be in the Pacific. So in, a, a large increase in, in, in prime production in the Pacific. So this is the very basics of, of aerosols. And this nice diagram comes from um, PhD student Elisa bergers who works on the atmospheric composition group of the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. Um, her, her PhD is, is focused on iron, but just for the atmospheric part. 
but basically it explains really well what happens in, with aerosols. Aerosols can come from different sources, from dust from the Sahara, for instance, or, or from, from anthropogenic activities or from wildfires. Uh, but the important part for, for, for us oceanographers is what happens to these aerosols, and, and in particular what happens with the iron in these aerosols, uh, during their lifetime in the atmosphere. Because in the atmosphere, there's different processes. Basically, there's three processes listed here. Oh, sorry about that. That shouldn't be happening. That's very sorry. It's, I don't understand. It's, it's blocked. I don't know why it's. Sorry. Um, so there's three processes in the atmosphere, and these processes actually uh, make iron much more soluble. And, and so it's important to know not only which is the source, um, and also which is the, the process that, that occur in the atmosphere, and how um, eventually these uh, aerosols come into the water. So for the wildfires in particular, there are so far, uh, least, maybe I'm wrong, maybe there's some new ones, but as far as I know, there's at least four um, um, published papers where they show observations. Those are now, now it's not modeling anymore. Now it's really observations about pot potential impacts or different kinds of impacts of um, um, pyrogenic aerosols uh, into, into the ocean. The first one I'm going to talk about is the one um, I led uh, together with Wei Yi Tang in 2000. Well, no, actually, we, le we led it in 2020. And it, it was for the Southern Pacific. and. And everything started with <coughs> the fire. <coughs> Sorry. When I was finishing my postdoc in Tasmania, Tasmania is the island that is where well, you can see there's a cloud, but it's just the bottom of, of Australia. Um, uh, uh, some months later, we left Tasmania. There was these very, very large um, fires in the southeastern part of Australia. There's always fires in, in Australia, but these ones were particularly strong and particularly exceptional because of the place, because usually this is not the kind of forest that, is, that burns in, in Australia and mm, because of their in intensity. They were very massive, and actually they were in the news. You probably heard about them, and journalists, they call it the Black Summer. Uh, and that was from 2018 November to January, February 2020. And here you can see a huge plume of um, dust and ash that goes into the Pacific Ocean, crosses, and um, actually um, New Zealand is there, right there, and it goes into the ocean. And so, Obviously, that was like the perfect case to analyze if there was any response of phytoplankton because we, these waters, uh, we knew that are, most of them are iron limited and the amount of ice was, was massive. So it was like the perfect experiment. So we, we tested, the first thing we tested, like the easiest thing you can do with aerosols is that you test the AOD at the atmosphere. So this on the top is the anomaly of AOD, uh, only for black carbon. And the one at the bottom is the anomaly of chlorophyll. And well, Good news are that we found some large anomalies of chlorophyll, and mostly in two regions, one south of Australia and another one in a very large region, uh, southeastern Pacific. To give you an idea of the scale of this, of this box in, in, in the southern Pacific, this is the same size as um, the Sahara Desert. And to give you an idea of how big this increase was, is like you need to imagine that the Sahara Desert um, become grasslands during four or six months. So we're not talking about forest. There was not a massive prime production, but there was an increase of prime production in a region that is usually very, very low in, in chlorophyll. Here we see again this, this how weak was that. So if you look at, at, at the time tree, it's important to know the chlorophyll concentration. As you can see, the, sorry, the, the values are not very high because usually the values in this region are extremely low. What is exceptional here is the size and, 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 and the peak that we could not see any similar peak in the 22 years record of the satellite. And so the red shaded areas are the positive anomaly. And, and you can also see that, that the anomaly lasted um, for a long time, well after mm, the ice was not there. So basically the ice fell during one or two weeks and, 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 and the response lasted for six to one year, six, six months to 12 months. So, but of course, um, the hardest part of this theory was not to, to found this anomaly, that, um, easy was to prove that this correlation was actually and um, um, there was a driver of the ash into the into the into the carpet and the main issue we got is like when you look at the total deposition actually there's no way to observe the deposition that's one of the main challenges of uh, stealing aerosols so these the outputs of a model um, of a reanalysis basically 
And, and the total deposition shows that there's lots of ice um, coming in, in the Tasman Sea between Australia and New Zealand in the southern Tasman Sea, while the concentration of chlorophyll is only focused in, in two places. No, why, why all these other waters are not responding to this incorporation of, of ice? So we try to, to, to explain this um, and the way, uh, basically how, why it's not responding in these two uh, red areas here. Um, the first thing we needed to do was to prove that actually these aerosols contain iron, and this was possible thanks to a sampling station that is in Tasmania, in, in top of um, Kuniani Mountain, and they are sampling since 2018, I think, and doing analysis of these aerosols, they are able to know if the aerosols are coming from wildfires, thanks to a proxy uh, uh, called Levo Glocusan, basically. So what you can see here is that green, the green bars are the level glucose sun, is this, this proxy for wildfires. So we, we see that we have aerosols coming from wildfires, and we also see in the line, blue line, I guess, I'm sorry, I'm colorblind, so sometimes I get messed up with color. Um, uh, the blue line shows that the, when we received, or when the sample station was um, um, capturing aerosols from the wildfires, the labile iron, the soluble iron, was very high also in these aerosols. And so that kind of closed the idea of, yeah, okay, there, there was iron in these aerosols, and these aerosols, by the, for this date, they were coming from the source uh, that we knew, of the wildfires. So, um, the, sorry, the, same here. the other aspect that, was, uh, that wasn't covered in, in, in the study we did, but that, that's a, um, a study that came later, uh, it was about the duration, how, how it's possible that, that, that um, the, the anomaly was so, so long. And one of the reasons uh, was because of that. So, and that's one of the big challenges we have right now when studying wildfire aerosols, is that actually, I'm oh, sorry, this is going really much. Um, actually, you, hear, you have here um, the black carbon anomaly, so what it comes from the fire, and the one at the bottom, you have the dust anomaly. So you, you can see that the, there was a very big um, black carbon anomaly, and just after that, we have some months uh, where the dust anomaly is higher than normal. That occurs for two reasons. The first one is that the big fires, um, they do not bring only ash from the organic matter. They actually bring the uplift, the soil in the forest. So what you capture as aerosols is a mix of the organic matter and, and dust. The other reason is that when you have very intense wildfires, um, the, the, the land becomes very easily erodible. So the wind then is um, much more um, able to, 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 to bring dust into, into, into the atmosphere. This, the kind of... Yeah, but there's no laser. It doesn't work. Hmm. It's on. I don't know where the... On. Aha! It's this. No. Anyway, no worries. Yeah, if something is not clear, please let me know. I can work. Um, so that's basically the idea. So the first thing is that the pyroconvective updraft that, that mix um, smoke and dust all together. And the other one is the one that occurs in the post burn landscape, let's call here, is the this dust plume that comes later. And this has been um, um, captured in, in several observational papers. So. This one was a comparison of aerosols, the content in, in aerosols um, for fire scenarios, so when aerosols come from fire, and when aerosols, when they call here background, what they mean is that aerosols that don't come from fire. And the ones on the top is aluminium, so aluminium is used to, to know if aerosols come from, have a lithogenic source, basically, if you come from land. And you can see that there's no difference. So, so the important result here is that they're the same. So th we have no means to differentiate or to say, we can say that fire aerosols don't contain lithogenic material. They are both the same. And this is the same result that found uh, in this um, study. This is a very recent study where they basically, they take um, leaves and, and branches and different types of trees and they burn it in a small chamber and they analyze um, the aerosols. And what they found is um, probably the most interesting thing is the last sentence of the abstract that I've, I've, I've pasted here. Most of the iron aerosolized during biomass burning is accounted for by soil suspended particles. So they found no iron in their, in their experiment. That means that if there's iron in pyrogenic aerosols, this is coming from, from the soil. So I won't talk about this anymore because actually in my project, we didn't knew all that during when I wrote I my proposal, but I thought that it's an important uh, aspect that needs to be explored. So uh, a second region um, where um, some authors found 
impacts is the Arctic, and this is particularly important and relevant for several reasons. Basically, um, they found a, a, an anomaly of chlorophyll. It's very hard to do that in the Arctic because you have lots of clouds and you have ice and, and ocean color uh, struggles there. But they found a, a, a big anomaly. So here the, the, the circles are the anomaly of chlorophyll and the line um, is the, the climatology. And what's interesting there is that iron is not limiting in the Arctic. So what they, um, their conclusion is that actually it's, it's nitrates that are bringing um, this, this, that, are, that are fertilizing the Arctic waters uh, up there. They were not able to explain the response of chlorophyll only using the nitrates from the trees. And the way they managed to explain it was um, by um, estimating the nitrate that is in the permafrost that it, when it burns, so the tundra is um, a very has a high concentration in nitrates, and when it burns, it can bring the nitrates they needed to explain this response. Um, the other one was the first one that has uh, that was published in California and was a ship. Uh, actually, it was is an interesting paper because it's written by students. The students they were master of students on a ship during a part of a course, and there was a fire at the same time, so they decided to change the whole plan and to, to sample aerosols and, well, sample, sample the ash, basically, and, and the impacts of the fire. They did not find any response on the chlorophyll. Um, basically, they, they did not find any fertilizing, fertilizing effect. Sorry, again. But they found uh, a change in the community composition. So there was much less, um, so sorry, here, acid is um, the, the, the fire season, um, while the PNB is the non-fire season. So they, for the acid um, observations, they found a much less um, diatoms concentration and very high dinoflagellates. So there was a shift of the, of, um, and, that, and that wasn't have seen any before because they usually go to Santa Barbara Channel. So um, that was interesting too because if we, if we deal with um, export or changes in community, so we know that changing the, the, the fight around the community can have impacts on, on all this. And the last one I want to present, I think, is interesting because it shows not a single response, but a decadal variability. So this um, in the south and uh, northwestern Australia, where fires are very common, there's fires every, every year uh, at different intensity. This particular year is very strong, for instance. Um, what they found is that the decadal variability of chlorophyll in the region was dominated by wildfires. Much or was or what could be explained by wildfires much more um, than by INSO or by or by the Indian um, Ocean Dipole. So so they, they there are different scales of variability, of course. But what they showed is that at least in this region, um, wildfires are playing an important um, um, role on on the decadal variability of, of chlorophyll there. And this is something that is usually and not only for wildfires in aerosols in general. We don't usually look at, at how aerosols and change the, the, the low frequency variability in chlorophyll. And I think that's, a, that's another aspect interesting. Anyway, um, all that to justify um, why we started the project, or why I started the project. Um, um, fires, the, the area burn, uh, the global area burn is not increasing. And because, as I showed you before, um, most of the area burn comes from the Central Africa, and this is related to agriculture. Agricultur agricultural activities that are, that are changing, actually, and there, there's, there's policies that are uh, helping um, agriculture there. What is increasing is the, the fire weather season. So fire, um, seasons, fire seasons are becoming longer, and they are becoming longer in regions where there usually there was no fire or, or very short um, fire season. And what is um, striking is here at the bottom, you can see um, the results of all models. So all four CME5 models are, are the black line. The black line is the multi-model mean of these models. The gray, the gray shaded part is like the mix uh, of all different models. And the red um, trends are the observed ones. So you can see that the, the trends are much higher, the observed trends are much higher than the projected trends, where it's a bit concerning. Um, so, and, and where is this happening? So um, when we look at the chromatological mean, as what I was uh, telling you right now, so the on climatological mean, most black carbon or most aerosols are, are in the Central Africa, Indonesia. But uh, when we look at, at particular cases, so here it's only at the right map is the additive, uh, additive anomaly for the last, well, it's not the last anymore, but uh, from 2017 to 2021. And you can see that the, the, the patch are, are very different. Central Africa is not now an important region. 
the regions that are becoming important for um, aerosols or for wildfires are the northern, particularly the Siberia and the boreal forest, which can have a very high impact on, on, the, on the Arctic. We can see also here Australia, but Australia is not, is, that was a very particular exceptional case, and the, the, there is, it's not clear that the trends on wildfires there will be increasing. Um, so, and that's now just parentheses of a work done by Elisa that I presented before, and Douglas Hamilton at the US, uh, that they're actually improving the representation of, of fires in, in, in models, and one of the nicest results they have that is not published is this one where they show that um, when you model um, and the emission of fires and, in, and you project it into the future, they found a very, very strong um, increase in, in, in iron. So here, this map at the bottom, you can see this triangle. Um, this uh, is the contribution of the different sources of, uh, of iron. So um, iron D is dust, iron B is iron from biomass burning, and iron F is iron from fossil fuels. So you can see that the colors are mostly most of the globe, the most important contributor is, um, is that, for the iron. But when you, we go into the north for the, for the future, for, this, uh, for the future scenario, you can see that this changes, and in the Arctic, the biomass burning iron becomes the most important one, and this is what you can see here in, in this map. And it, and it can have very strong impacts in the Arctic, because it not, not only impacts phytoplankton, but of course also impacts the albedo. So it can, it can induce... Um, and sea ice melting and open waters and more blooms and so there's lots of feedback going on here. So anyway, from all this, how do we study these um, very exceptional cases? So, so extreme, uh, we, we are able to observe and we have, not perfect, but we have good tools to observe um, unprecedented events like the one uh, uh, in Australia, um, but, but how we explain it? And the only way to explain them is to, is to understand what's going on and, uh, in, and, and to understand them, we need to build some mechanistic um, knowledge. So, and that was the, the idea of pyroplankton. So pyroplankton um, tried to bring or uh, to tackle three different um, knowledge gaps. One was uh, which nutrients other than iron can be contributing. Um, there can be any potential toxicity um, induced by these aerosols. And which is ash, how ash interacts with organic matter and how this ultimately can impact the carbon export. There was also this knowledge gap I told you before about dust, ash, mix, emission, but and, and we don't we, we don't deal with that in the model uh, in the project. Sorry, the project has three parts: one based on remote observations, and second one called um, based on mesocosm experiments. That is the one I'm gonna um, tell you right now, and a third part where we try to bring all together in and um, basically a new model configuration with uh, improved iron representation. Um, the experiment. So the idea of the experiment is, is, is simple and was already done, um, sorry, has been done before for a, small, um, um, for a small experiment. The idea here was to do it big in an ecosystem that was representing um, all the plankton ecosystem. So the way we did it was to first we needed some ash because we had no dust and I contacted Christina Santin who used to be at the Swansea University and now she's a professor uh, in IMIP in, in Asturias. And she's, a, she's an expert on, 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 on land carbon, on, on, on for wildfires. So she, you can see here Christina um, collecting so much. And, and of course, she was um, a bit surprised that the oceanographer was contacting her. But then uh, I convinced her that it was a cool topic and she was very motivated to participate. And basically, the idea is to, to take, they, they have eyes from all different wildfires around the world. The first idea we had is like, okay, let's, let's use. And of course, because ash from Canadian forests have nothing to do with Canadian, uh, with Mediterranean forest, and nothing to do with eucalyptus in Australia. And the composition is completely different. And so the idea was to use at least three of these different ash and, and use them all the experiment, and then we saw that that was just impossible. It, everything com becomes very complex, so we decided to use only one type of ash. And the setup is, uh, this experiment was done in Institut de, de la Mer de Villefranche in, it's next to Nice, uh, uh, called IMEF. There's an, uh, sometimes they call it IMEF, there's another that's called LOP, but basically is a the CNRS and center in, in Villefranche, um, southeastern France. And they have this really nice setup, and that is a container, so it's a container they can, that they can put it in a ship if they want to, want to do experiments in the ship. It's a trace metal clean um, container, so inside you need to, to, to be dressed like this, and you need to be protected, and everything is in plastic and teflon, so there's no um, metals contamination inside. 
there's nine, nine tanks of 300 liters and um, waters each, and this, when it's not in the ship, is next to the sea, so actually they pump the water from the Bay of the French. And we did that in June because we wanted um, very illegal traffic um, water conditions from the Mediterranean. And you can control lots of things in, inside the tanks. Uh, you can control light, you can control, sometimes you can control CO2, wasn't the case for the experiment. Um, and you have a fire sensor, you have a, a propeller to bring some turbulence. And also interesting thing is that you have a sediment trap at the bottom. So you can, you can see what is, what is falling. Um, that's basically what I was telling you. Um, this is uh, the container. This is the Bay of Ville French where we took the water. You can see here the pump. That is, it's, it's a complex pump because, uh, again, there's no metals. So it's very hard to bring water uh, without touching any metal. And this is the, one of the tanks inside. So this used to be a video, but it doesn't work here uh, uh, anyway. That's a system that we created for the experiment that is a rain system, basically. And you can see that we are, so the water with the ice coming here. And, and this is turning around and, and there's these drops. You can see that the, the quantity of ice was very, very high. Um, that was one of the um, something to be discussed. But, um, and you can see that the, the ice is falling into the water and this is turning around. The reason why it was very, ice, uh, very high is, is because we found no other experiment before. We had no idea uh, would, about the results. And, and we said, okay, let's, let's take the highest observed um, deposition flux and let's use this value. And if nothing happens with this value, then okay, we can stop doing aerosols. But th things happen, so yeah. So that's basically the ice we got on dry, and there was ice that um, well, it was filtered um, to mimic um, a small um, particle. One of the main issues is that the ice we collected is not the ice that actually flies, because the ice that flies is not there anymore, of course. And, and so the way we, well, we had no idea how to <laughs> deal with that, but what did we did, and so this is the ash collected, and what we did is that um, Maria Santiso, um, she, she, um, she, she, she filtered, uh, and we, she filtered into a, a fraction and that was less than 20 uh, micrometers because it's the size of, of the aerosols. Of course, it doesn't mean that the composition is the same, but uh, anyway. Um, this, uh, this, that was our option, but just to show you a, a very recent paper, uh, also in the California papers, uh, California fires, they, the way they collected the ash for the experiment was um, brushing on uh, car windshields. So that, I mean, I have some comments on that, but I didn't review this paper, but um, anyway. But just to show you that actually it's a big issue. There's no way to collect ash uh, or to collect aerosols. It's not, it's not easy at all. So, um, well, that's basically a bit of, of numbers. I'm not sure we need to go there. That we basically characterize the chemical composition, so we, of course we first checked that there was something in the ash, and there was nitrate, phosphate, and iron, and there was lots of things going on, so that was kind of exciting. And we compared the ash, um, that's just to compare with the dust, to give you an idea of how different uh, the different aerosols are. Um, as you, so the, the two bottom rows are dust, are two dust experiments made by the same team, and the, 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 the top row is the ash. And you can see that um, phosphate it was much higher in dust than, um, I, sorry, phosphate was um, one order magnitude higher in ash than, than in dust. Um, nitrate is the same, was, uh, was much higher, um, but um, iron was kind of the same. It was not, 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 there was not a big difference, in, uh, at least for this kind of ash. So we started the experiment. We had these nine tanks, and we decided to, to, to select. So there was four tanks with no phytoplankton, where we filtered the water to 0.2 micrometers. Of course, no phytoplankton is a bit virtual, but um, we think that there was no phytoplankton. There was bacteria, but not phytoplankton. And the other ones, um, there was the, what we call the natural assemblage, is or the whole plankton ecosystem in the Mediterranean is in the tank. And we compare these two tanks. And we did that for um, 14 days. Uh, and well, uh, we sampled, um, we basically the experiment really lasted 10 days and then we did the last station under 14 days. And we sampled everything we could imagine. And, and, and the good thing is there was lots of people that, that was interested in the experiments and, and, and maybe some of you, you probably know, and there was Eva, Eva Ortega Retuerta that she came from the, um, from the TEPs and DNA and there was um, uh, from Marseille, Elvira Pulido, um, coming from the bacteria. Um, so there was people coming from different labs um, to work in the experiment. Results. So these are like the first results um, we have, and we're trying to make sense of that. 
Um, it's not easy. So we were expecting something nice and easy, and we found a very complex response. And now we we're struggling to, to, to see how all this makes sense. The, the first thing was iron. Here you can see, and that's the case where there's no, um, and there's no phytoplankton here. So now we're just talking about chemistry. It's, these are the three tanks where there, was, um, no, there, there is bacteria, but there's no, no phytoplankton and no plankton. And you can see that there's a, a, a very strong peak, uh, like the first station that was like 12 hours after um, the ash um, was um, um, deposited. And then we have this peak um, decreases very quickly and we have a second peak. And we think that this is related to the types of particles. So, so at the beginning, all sorts of particles are um, dissolving iron, but uh, just some hours later, um, the largest particles actually fall um, very quickly. And, you, you, and, you, and your dissolution rate uh, actually falls very quickly because there's, you, you have a much lower in concentration of particles in, in the water. Um, still, the value was very high. So we had um, four times increase in the in situ concentration. Um, and, and just to give you an idea, so, so the increase is like four, four, 10 nanometers of increase compared to the conditions in the Mediterranean. For phosphates, we had a really nice um, result. So you can clearly see here the black line is the control, and the other ones are the, the different additions. So the three tanks show the same, and they show a, a, a plateau of the solution. This kind of the expected um, response we could have when we when we put aerosols. For nitrates, on the other hand, it's a complete mess. We don't know what's going on here, um, but actually there's a decrease. There's no increase at all, and there's a big decrease. And to do it even more complex, um, this decrease depends on the quantity of ash. What is so the, 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 there's a very small gradient here of ash because actually we aim for seven, but um, well, as you know, when you work with labs, uh, things get more complex. And but you can see that the the, the response of nitrates is is proportional, or well, is actually inversely proportional of the amount of ash. And we actually know we don't know we don't know why. And the most surprising thing is that, uh, as I told you before, in the Arctic, they, they assumed that there was lots of nitrates. And in this paper, the ones that they collected um, ice from the windshield, they found lots of nitrates. Um, again, and I don't know if the nitrates were in the windshield and before the wildfire, but, but uh, I, 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 there's something going on here. So we don't know what's happening going on with nitrates. Nitrates are complex because a, an important part of the nitrates um, um, are obtained during the, 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 tran the, the atmospheric transport of the aerosols. So, so aerosols travel in the atmosphere, and during this time, they're able to capture some nitrate. Some, some nitrate. The nitrate sometimes they, they don't come from the source. They come from the processes. And in our case, um, these processes were absent because actually we're capturing the ash from the ground, and there was no atmospheric transformation. In their case, there is atmospheric transformation, so that could be a potential reason for the difference. The other one uh, is um, what is the impact in, in, in phytoplankton. So now we are showing the tanks where there is the whole ecosystem, and that's the, the, the changes in chlorophyll. And you can see the black line again is the control, so there was no ash in the control. And, and you can see we, f we find a, a peak that is more or less at the same timing as the iron peak. And then there's a strong decrease, and this decrease is pretty strong, and it's actually even stronger than the control run. That, that's a, also um, something that we like to explore. So the black line, at some points you can see, is above um, the other lines, so what it means that the control was containing more chlorophyll, uh, and that could be induced by uh, co-limitation or limitation by, um, by, by nitrates or, or by toxicity or other aspects. One of the hypotheses is light. So this um, a simulation of the, so the, the the, the, these lines here, these the simulation, these are the observations. So what we see is that, of course, um, ash is black, and, and the tanks were kind of limited environment, and when you put the ash there, everything comes dark, the light goes and um, drops to zero, and, or, well, almost zero, this is normalized. And, 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 and that, uh, obviously, that will have a strong impact on chlorophyll, not only because they, they can produce, they maybe can produce, but what could happen is that they adapt to very low light. So you, maybe your, your chlorophyll response is, is, a, is a light response, is a light adaptation response, rather than an increase in production. And these are the things we're trying to explore right now. And for bacteria, bacteria were extremely happy in the waters where there was no plankton, of course. 
and they they produced a lot. And one of um, while in the natural assemblage, and um, this production was much lower because of course there was the competition um, with with phytoplankton. Um, something we're trying to disentangle now is um, what we see in, not in in production, but in in sorry, I'm not showing you here bacterial um, concentration. Bacterial concentration is very different to production. It does show a peak, like the iron and the chlorophyll. And one of the hypotheses, actually this is one of the Eva's hypotheses, is that some um, bacteria are attached to, <coughs> to the particles and that these particles sink. So at the beginning you have lots of bacteria, but, the, but then some hours later you don't have any bacteria anymore because most of them were attached to the particles were attached to the particles, or maybe these bacteria were coming from the forest, were coming from the ice of the forest, and they were able to cope in the water? That's an open question, but okay. And <clears throat> the other nice aspect is that we have the sediment traps, and that's something that um, Matthew Bresak is, is exploring. Is, um, we know that for dust um, is the process called lithogenic carbon pump, so that dust can induce um, or can enhance carbon export, not because of fertilization, but because um, it attaches the matter, at, uh, organic matter attached around, around particles and then it sinks um, much faster. And, and we, we assume that could happen the same with ice, actually. One of the things we're seeing is that ice is, is, is acting as an absorption um, element and for, we have some analysis with other metals and we see that there is a decrease of, 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 of some metals in, in the water from the, from the initial state once we incorporate the ice. And that's basically because ice is cleaning the water. It's acting uh, as absorbing and bringing these, these, these metals into the bottom. And that could ha happen also for organic matter. And this, uh, Matthew is looking at that. You can have uh, the picture at the bottom uh, from electronic microscopy. You can see here, this is a Nash particle that is marked on the black um, contour. And you can see some organic matter around. So there's some interesting things going on here. Just to finish, I would like to thank all the people who contributed to the experiment, and particularly to Cecile and Guillaume and Frédéric Gazot, who are the leaders of this team, and they allowed me to, 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 to bring my, my project um, there. Um, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into the modeling. Um, just to tell you that while well, we're doing some experiments, I'm putting aerosols into, into Pisca's model and, and seeing what's going on. Um, just I wanted to finish with a couple of um, advertisings, maybe. Um, the first one is that we organized um, part of Fire Planton, um, and, and thanks to a, a, a Future Earth um, and ESA call, that is actually is an open call if you want to organize any workshops or something. Uh, I recommend you to look at this call, Future Earth ESA joint call. And we, we, we got their grant to organize a, a workshop because we tried to bring the, the whole fire community together, because the fire tackles lots of different aspects from society to forest to land to ocean to atmosphere. And we try to bring all these different um, um, actors, not only from academia, but also from the society and from the operational part, into, into a workshop that we did in September. And now we're um, um, working on a, on a white paper. One of the nice things of the workshop is that we invited an artist, and the artist um, came up with this um, nice um, image of all the ways how uh, um, fires interact with the carbon cycle globally. The second one is, um, I guess most of you know Solas, or if you know it, um, that's why I, I want to advertise. Solas is, is, is an, uh, a global research network um, focused on the air sea exchanges, and I'm the chair um, of the Early Career Committee, so if there's any um, early career who works on these topics, and air sea, so anything related to air sea going on on this domain, we're interested in that, and members are changing all the time, and we're seeking for feedbacks, even if you're not a member, so um, feel free to contact me. That's all. Thank you. <laughs> Do you have any questions? A great talk, Joanne. Thank you. Um, you took the perspective or the hypothesis of uh, ash fertilizing blooms because you observed that in the field and so forth. So for, in your experiment, you took this perspective. But of course, this ash can be toxic as well. or can be harmful some, somehow. How do you address this? Because I was thinking of uh, all the pyrogenic compounds 
the PAHs, I mean, the, the polycyclic aromatic compounds and things like that, that you add with the ash into the tanks. And I wonder they, whether they can be toxic. I mean, there are some reports, some hmm. people claiming that they are toxic to phytoplankton. Um, so this, I mean, you see a, a decrease in, 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 yeah, in chlorophyll, actually. And, yeah, and but so it's, it's a small, though. So I'm, I'm not sure that this is statistically. So I, I highlight it because I think the result is interesting. Um, so here, the 11th July, you can see that the control is above the the, the ash addition and tanks, but I'm not sure that that's statistically um, relevant. I think that the, if we yeah. if we need if we want to say that this is toxic, then we need to go much beyond beyond. And then I yeah. think that now we incorporated um, in the team there was people from the um, um, atomic agency in Monaco uh, who were able to sample uh, metals like lead and and mercury because um, there was in, in at a lab they had no way to, to sample these very small concentrations of these metals in, in seawater. Um, so they're, they're now um, treating this, this. The first results I saw, they, didn't, they don't show any significant value. So we don't think, or at least they are all below the toxic levels we, we know. But, but this is still an open question. Yeah. Okay, and another comment is that um, a long, very long time ago, I did uh, uh, some work on on pyrolytic compounds in aerosols, and, and and I kind of managed to to simulate. It's always a simulation. I mean, a, an experimental mess <laughs> simulating things. But I I used uh, um, what is that a uh, solar simulator where you have solar ir ir irradiation, I mean, simulated solar irradiation with a shin and lamp. We have it here in the lab. And also air flushing. So by this way, I took fresh aerosols from urban environments, like your ash from the ground, and I managed to kind of simulate the selective loss of some compounds, the semi-volatiles and things like that. This is just to, to suggest that you may be, I know it's very, very hard to take a, a real aerosol sample, mm -hmm. yeah, an, an aged aerosol sample, but mm -hmm. you may be able to age it in the lab so that you have fresh, say, yeah, absolutely. from they, the ground and aged aerosols that they, could make a difference. They've done them for dust. They have um, aging chambers, oh, okay. where they basically change the acidification of, of the aerosols. And, and, and that was, when we designed the experiment, that was on the table. But again, we, we, we wanted to do it very simple, as simple as possible. And, and, and even with that, and the result has been super complex. So, but yeah, of course, these are the kind of experiments that need to be done. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for the talk. I, I, I'm... I don't know if, if I missed it, but when you were explaining the, the observations in the Tasmanian Sea and how uh, you saw a response in the chlorophyll concentration, not particularly in the Tasmanian Sea no. where the highest no. deposition was found, I don't know if I missed the explanation for that or do you have no, any hypothesis? I think it was my it? fault. It was my fault. <laughs> uh, I, I, yeah, I brought you somewhere and didn't, I didn't. <laughs> provide um, the solution. Um, uh, basically, sorry, that was, because I was a bit concerned by the time, then I, I jumped, but uh, you're completely right. Yeah, thank you for asking. Um, basically, what we try to show in this, in this map is like, the first thing, the green pixels at the bottom is the places where we detect both uh, chlorophyll anomaly and a deposition that is very strong. Okay. And, and we see that this only happens in these two regions because of um, the chlorophyll pattern. And the, the, the main difference are two. Um, how to do it without the point of anyway, the first one is the subtropical front that is marked here in this um, the dotted line. Okay, so we know that more or less iron limitation starts there. So you need to be south of, of the subtropical front, and this explains why the Tasman Sea has no um, response on iron. Um, the other one is south of the Tasman Sea, so the big um, ellipse um, south of New Zealand. Why there's no response there? This is still uh, uh, an open question, my personal view. So we, we, we went like, we, like, we still combined the question in the paper. And, and what I think is, um, is the um, circulation, basically. 
So when you have a very strong circulation, here you have the ACC, one of the strongest circulation in the world, um, the aerosols get mixed very quickly, and phytoplankton, uh, probably, there's a, there's a, there's a, probably there's an impact, but you, you don't see it at surface. You need to have some still waters uh, in order to see a response in the chlorophyll, and this is the case uh, for the anomaly in the, in, in, in the Pacific. This region is extremely um, calm, there's nothing going on there, and so it's kind of using a tank experiment almost. And, and this, but this is uh, my personal hypothesis. And, yeah, and, 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 yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so, my question was related to the culturing experiments when you were talking about. First, you said you looked only at the chemistry in the sense that you didn't have phytoplankton, but then you started talking about only the samples with heterotrophic plankton. So the first ones, are they completely sterile? And when you talk about heterotrophic bacteria, are you somehow removing just large cells that you assume to be large phytoplankton, or do you also get rid of the picocyanobacteria? No, we, sorry, no, I'm sorry, that's up. So we, we, we don't get rid of bacteria anywhere. That's, that's okay. the, 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 the simplest response, because um, we were, had no ways of filtering. So there's, there's no sterilization. It okay. was just a mechanical um, filtering at 0.2 micrometers. And so what we, s sorry, yeah, here. So this is the main difference between when we could talk about filtrate is the, the water that has been filtered at 0.2 you know, micrometers, and natural assimilate is a water that hasn't been filtered. Actually, it was filtered, but very large, just, you know, just to be so that there was no salts or plastics coming in. Um, so the natural assemblage, you have all the bacteria and all the um, plankton, while in the filtered waters, we assume that there's no phytoplankton. There might be small, very small phytoplankton in, 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 in there. But what this response shows is that um, the bacteria are um, responding very high, much, much higher in the filtered tanks than the other tanks. But it should suggest that actually we did the filtered, we, fi we, we filtered the phytoplankton well. But to filter 0 0.22, you said? Z so 0 point micrometers. Yeah. So you should have no bacteria to have production. You're filtering 300 liters. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> no, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I wasn't there, but um, <laughs> <laughs> no, no. This, this is the part that Cecilia and Matthew did. Yeah. Um, it was extremely complex, and actually, I, I struggled to explain it. But the, in order to pump through 0.2 micrometers, um, the, you need to create a. Uh, uh, they, they, they had no pumps to do it because the pumps um, were metal made. So they had the big pump I showed before that, that was just to bring the water in the container, but then to filter it. They used it created an, uh, a, uh, a, pression, a pressure difference um, with, um, with gas bottles, basically. From, um, so they, they, they created the empty in one part and then they filtered it. So that was some, something very complex that we didn't really understood. But um, yeah, I can't tell you more than that. Yeah. Hi, thank you for the talk, very interesting. Um, my question is uh, about the little effect you have when you add ash in the mesocosm experiment. And um, following the comment of, uh, of Raphael, um, I was wondering, you, you know, no, the increase of nitrogen, phosphate, silicate that you had when you add, you have this hmm? evaluated, no? Yeah, we sampled that. Then you can uh, make some rough calculations on how much biomass you will expect yeah. if it's nothing toxic. And yep. then we, maybe with these uh, calculations, you can evaluate it. If yeah. Hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah, you need to know the soluble part of it. Yeah. So it's not that easy. But yeah, we, yeah, yeah, you. you but you, you yeah. measure nutrients in the water at the time zero? No, we did not measure in the water. So we have these values in the dry ash. Ah. And, well, and, and we have the, the initial state. But you have water frozen from, from this experiment? Sorry? 
you have uh, still samples for that you can uh, do it? Or? There, no, I don't think so. This, we have no. Mm. No, that was like yeah. And and the other thing is, um, do you have also the composition of the phytoplankton? Yeah, hmm. we have. Um, and this and difference yeah. between the not addition and with addition. Well, we don't see any response in the in in the control runs. Yeah, but there is phytoplankton, no? Which it changes the composition when you add ash. Yeah, 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 it does. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it, yeah, yeah. Basically, the response we see is from diatoms, so the, the ones, so this kind of the expected um, thing. Expected. So the, the large yeah. cells um, were the ones that are. So this this change in profile is m mostly led um, by um, by yeah. large um, cells. Yeah. We don't see response on the other ones, basically. Yeah. Why is it zero? The phosphate is normalized. Sorry. It's, it's normalized. Yeah, we normalized them with the first value. That's why the control is, is zero. Yeah. It's to show the increase and the was very high. Yeah. The, the, um, the yeah, yeah, you see here the institute. This is the, the background value. Yeah. The other thing is um, you don't filtrate at all the, this water when you have phytoplankton. That means you, you have zooplankton too. No? Yeah, yeah, we do. Yeah. And then the, the, the the, the decrease, decrease can yeah, be yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, the, there's, the, there's the grazing also going on. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Um. And also, I would say that maybe a decreasing of bacteria in the filtrate ones, if some flagellate goes in it, maybe also grazing on bacteria. They can, they maybe, can maybe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. They have some DNA samples, and that um, they haven't been analyzed yet. Um, so yeah, that, that, that could explain part of this question. Yeah. I also was curious about what you said about this ash helping form aggregates that sink faster. Mm -hmm. So I guess um, one way to test that hypothesis would to, would to compare that data with the carbon export ratios in these regions that are receiving ash and see if it is in fact affected by it. And even though it might not have been part of the initial project, there's huge data sets of that that probably would match at least spatial temporally with these fires that you could compare to or, or not. But it's, it's really hard to get export data from this, so from these, from these fires. And one one of the for instance, one of the issues we got in in the Pacific um, um, anomaly is that we mm -hmm. had no we managed to find two Argo floats in the region that they gave us some it was basically a proof that the site was not a, an issue with the uh, satellite mm -hmm. um, just to prove that there was indeed a change in in bugs in in particular um, organic carbon but the export that you can estimate I I, I do exports with biochemical cargo floats but they're very very mm -hmm. Uh, so th the things. So wh one of one of the things we concluded in the paper is that you need some kind of emergency kit that you could go there when there's an extreme event, mm -hmm. and that's that's very hard to do in the Southern Ocean, but that's very easy to do in the Mediterranean. And so one of the ideas um, I'm developing with actually is a proposal we we submitted a month ago, and with South Keep in Balears is that they have these gliders. So to have a glider that is ready. Um, for the fire season, mm -hmm. and and once you, we we see we see a big fire or a big dust storm, we put the the, the glider below, and we, we start sampling um, at high frequency, and that could be a way of of, of seeing if we can see any response in, in the carbon export. But and, and I would expect there's a temporal delay as well, right? In the sense that once the ash gets there, it takes a lot of time for or some time for it to solubilize and actually influence the microbial community and then be exported, right? So you would be... What you see from the experiment is that it goes very, very quickly. Very quickly. In a okay. matter of hours. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. What is um, also very complex is in the real ocean is that um, the strongest deposition, they come from precipitation. So they're very f f concentration, is mm -hmm. what the position. So you, you see a big cloud of ice in the atmosphere, but you have no idea where this is going to fall. Um, and, and, and it's going to be very, very concentrated. So you need to it's hard to to be there at the right time and the yeah. Yeah, 
Some early experiments of mineral dust and effect on, on plankton and so on were also done with um, uh, soil that was collected in some Saharan area, whatever, uh, that it was known it was a source area and so forth. Uh, but then, and Gia, Cecil Gear was on the main um, uh, people that helped understand this, uh, that when it travels through the air, the composition changes, the size particle distribution changes, all kinds of things happen. And as Rafael said, it's very important to, when you do stuff with a source uh, material, you have to somehow simulate what happened to it when it traveled. Um, but anyhow, uh, this, this pyrogenic material from ashes can also be collected with large volume samplers uh, on filters. And then they've already traveled whatever distance they have traveled uh, uh, and of course, it will be mixed with some other dust yeah. particles as and well, or, or, yeah. or, or anthropogenic particles from high temperature combustion from cars and so forth as well. But you can still characterize all this chemically and see what fraction comes from the ashes, actually. Um, so and the other thing is then the solubilization part. In general, these experiments are done with a prior experiment where you dissolve these uh, source ashes in, in, in water, and there's a question there whether you acidify this water or not, and also when you add then the ashes to the containers, whether you put some acid on it so that some metals dissolve, like mm. iron and so forth. So just, I just wanted to um, comment on these issues and maybe see what your opinion is about all this. No, no, yeah, yeah you're completely right. Uh, for, for the first part, um, we work a lot with um, Morgan Perron, so these are the papers. Oh, sorry. So the, the, the results I showed you before were um, the, in, this, in this direction. You were, sorry, it's here somewhere. So these results here. Um, the Morgan Perron, um, she works a lot on, on, on collecting ash and aerosols um, in, while in the atmosphere, and these sort of things. Another impress, interesting um, venue in this sense is um, the isotopes, so now and they're working with iron isotopes, and they're able to disentangle if this iron was coming from dust or was coming from, from wildfires, from different. Um, for the second one, um, we also, I mean, there is actually, yeah, the solubilization is a, is a big topic. There's actually a, a working group now um, by SCORE called Rusted that they, on, uh, they only deal with this question because they, 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 they realized that inside the community, everybody was talking about solubilization or solubility, and everybody was sampling it and, 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 and measuring it in different ways. Some, some people with acid, others without acid, leaching, not leaching. So, so this is a big issue, and, and we did some experiments um, um, on, on solubilization and in, in one liter. And, but yeah, so we, are, we have this evidence of what's happening. But we did not use any acid. Yeah, but also the particle size distribution, once you put particles in water, might behave completely different if they are, let's say, around 2 microns or something like this, or 20 microns or 0.2 microns, you know. And I guess these ashes, once they travel in the air, are very fine particles, if, if I'm correct, I don't know. Yeah, yes, these are the ones, um, so the, the, the normal size is, um, that, that's why we filter them, and we compare the composition. Uh, did it the here? So this is the particle size uh, in the in the in the in the act in the actual ash, and and we we, we filter this to to less than twenty micrometers fraction. That is kind of the fraction that we know that can fly, that can be aerosolized, and that was one mm, twenty total for example. The Composition, the chemical composition did not change. So one of the tests that Christine and Maria did is that um, they um, analyzed the chemical composition while the different filtering processes and the, the chemical composition was the same. But, but again, that's just a, a way of, yeah. But still 20 microns, is a, it's a large size for yeah. a, an air traveling particle. Hmm. It is. Yeah, but Maria spent lots of hours that <laughs> she couldn't do anymore. Yeah. Um, thank you for, for the talk. I think, uh, probably has already appeared in this discussion, but uh, I found surprising that the increase of chlorophyll uh, was so minor, in fact. You said it was very strong, it was from 0 0.3, 0 0.4. Yeah. Um, 
I don't know if this is what you expected, or you expected a much higher response of chlorophyll. And the question was, in the, in the ocean that you see this patch in the southern uh, Pacific, that there was an increase of chlorophyll, which was the, um, the increase of chlorophyll? If it is the same done in your mesocosms. Hmm. It's, it's actually very similar. Um, so in the ocean, in the ocean it was very, very low, the increase. It was exceptional, but very low in absolute numbers. So okay. the peak is below 0.3. Is nothing, um, and and that 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 oops, that so that, yeah. and that, that so that that's why this map is showing you a big anomaly. But that's actually because this is the relative anomaly. So this is the percentage. Basically, the relative anomaly is showing how how strange is this signal was with compared to the mm. the whole record. But it doesn't tell you anything about the absolute um, value. I am still very surprised that the, the response of chlorophyll is, doesn't seem to be very large. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, we're in the same thing in the, in the experiment. We're at similar values. Yeah, we didn't expect it anything. It's kind of the expected, but yeah. Yeah, I know. I have some personal views on that idea. <laughs> yeah. There's another thing about uh, oligotrophy. I mean, uh, in Villa French, it's oligotrophic water, but if you go to the Eastern Mediterranean, it's more oligotrophic. Mm. And in the Eastern Mediterranean, you have huge depositions of, uh, air, uh, of, of dust from the Sahara, maybe, okay? But the effect on phytoplankton is smaller than in the Western Mediterranean. And this is because there are bacteria there, and they are also starved for nutrients, mm. that once you add a little bit of nutrient, are the bacteria that take them all up because they are much better competitors by, because of surface to volume ratios and so mm. forth. And this makes that the phytoplankton can only respond after some days when some nutrients are recycled. But the ones that take up all the, especially when you also add a carbon, a carbon source there. So the bacteria have now carbon and they also have the nutrients that come from the dust. Yeah, they're the perfect and they're the ones, then they grow f happily and fast and they don't leave any nutrients for phytoplankton to grow. If you are less, a little bit less oligotrophic, like in the Western Mediterranean, there's some room for phytoplankton to grow. Um, but something like this might be happening here in your experiments. Yeah, and also the grazing, because uh, you have zooplan the grazing pressure can be very high in oligotrophic um, um, waters. And, and that they, 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 they manage to, to you know, they, they have no, no room for, for increasing because the grazing is, is already high. Well, it's for the things as hypo tunneling hypothesis. Uh, well, phosphorus is always very fast to, to recycle, mm -hmm. so it's very complicated to follow the paths, but anyhow. Hey, well, thanks for the talk. And I wanted to ask, so you saw this decrease in, in, in nitrate, <laughs> yeah. which is super, super puzzling. Yeah. And do you have any way? So first of all, the decrease, did it happen in both in the filtered and, and unfiltered tanks? Yeah, yeah, it did. It, it happened everywhere. In a similar way. It, yeah. So it was not, basically, I just showed the one without plankton because huh. Yeah. Is the most striking one, I guess, because uh, if there's plankton, you could see no, that's a very strong yeah. uptake, right? But no, <laughs> there's no uptake here. But there's there's bacteria, but it doesn't explain. So, so it, it's it doesn't look very different in the unfiltered water tanks. No, no, no I mean, yeah, I don't know. I can I can connect to. Well, no, and do know. you have any way to track where this okay. nitrate w went? So sorry. Do you have any way to try to to track the total um, nitrogen pool and seeing whether this added nitrate went into like uh, sedimenting particles, settling particles? Or well, we have the sediment traps. Or if, 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 if we could see if increased, uh, well, something we, we should have done differently, and now it's easy to say, but <laughs> is that um, the sediment trap, uh, we only change it um, once. So we changed it, the first time we changed the sediment trap was at the, f at the f four or five days after the ash addition. And, and we see that the whole dynamics happen in the 12th, 21st hours. Yeah. So the perfect case would be that you change the same trap every day and you could see these dynamics. Now what we have is like a bulk of all what has been going on during four days. And we might see some nitrates there, but I find it hard because there will be a mix of everything and things have been evolving also in, in there, you know. Yeah. Um, so, 
Yeah, no, no, but that's a, that's a good question. Now, where, where, where did this nitrate work? <laughs> um, yeah, this is something, uh, something that seems to came out, that's coming out from the results is that um, the, is, is, is the chemistry that is dominating this, the, the responses. So we see very similar responses in, in, in the two treatments. What it means that the plankton didn't play a major role in, a, in anything there. So this is the kind of conclusion we're getting, but we're now trying to arrange things. Yeah. Oh, thanks. <laughs> That's <laughs> it's an open question, right? We can discuss it later. Yeah, this is the filtrated, yeah. No, we, we did the numbers and no, 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 there's no way. And that, that's, that's why we think that there's some, this, this chemistry going on there, yeah. <laughs> Maybe the, uh, we think there's more absorption, that ash is actually capturing elements and, and there's cleaning water, and it's cleaning the water. But it's kind of the opposite of what, what we expected, but <laughs> ash is acting as a, like a cleaner more than a, yeah. <laughs> Great. So, so thanks to you, Joan, for this very interesting talk. Thank you for inviting me. And we'll see you soon again. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I'm in Barcelona, so anybody who wants to meet or anything, you know, it's easy. Yeah, thank you.